Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our part two of our joint venture with the uh, Small Business Administration. Uh, this is webinar part two of the big picture of SBA lending for credit unions. We're grateful for everyone joining us today. My name is Katherine Baxter. I am going to be your moderator for today's event. But before I turn the console over to Bill Briggs, I'm going to give you a few housekeeping items. Please look at your screen. So just adjust the volume on your computer so that you can hear this webinar. If you'd like to resize the slides, you may drag the bottom right corner to do that. Now from this website, you will need to allow pop-ups. There's an ask a question feature also on your console. Um, and we'd like you to ask questions throughout the webinar. And if you know the speaker's name, please address your question directly to that speaker. And we will get to our Q&A se session at the end of this webinar. And of course, as always, in approximately three weeks, this webinar will be closed captioned for on-demand viewing at the location there on our um, USA Learning uh, LMS website. So before I turn it over to Bill, we have a couple of polling questions that we'd like to ask our audience. We'd like to know who we have in our audience today. So um, is your credit union uh, up to 50 million in assets? Is your credit union between 51 to 250 million? Is your credit union between 251 and 1 billion? Or are you over a billion? Or are you not a credit union at all? We're gonna give you a few seconds to answer those questions because we'd really like to know who we have in our audience today. And we hope everyone will benefit from this. So use the radio buttons on your screen in order to answer the question. You ready? Here we go. Okay. Here we go. There we are. Okay, so it looks like we have quite a bit of credit unions that are between 250 million to a billion in billion dollars and we have quite a few that are not credit unions. Interesting. So now before we go on, we're going to ask you another poll question. How about this one? Have you been offering or how long have you been offering SBA loans? Has it been less than a year? Between one to three years? Between four to seven years? Eight to ten years? Have you been offering SBA loans more than ten years? Are you currently not offering SBA loans or are you simply not a financial institution? Use the radio buttons on your screen to answer the questions. Remember, less than a year, one to three years, four to seven years, eight to 10 years, more than 10 years, not offering SBA loans, not a financial institution. So let's see what our answers are. Okay, great. So we have quite a few that are not offering any SBA loans. So this will be an interesting webinar for you, even though it's geared towards credit unions that are offering uh, commercial lending. But we do have a few that have been doing SBA lending for quite some time. So now I'm going to turn our webinar over to Bill Briggs. He's a senior advisor of the Office of Capital As Access with the Small Business Administration. Thank you, Bill, take it away. Thanks, Catherine, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. My name is Bill Briggs. I'm the Senior Advisor in the uh, Office of Capital Access at the Small Business Administration. We are excited to have this second webinar uh, today where we're going to present to you a little bit more about SBA lending. We're going to go a little bit more in depth. Uh, if you recall from our last presentation, we talked about, um, we kind of gave an overview of SBA, uh, SBA uh, lending, things to consider, and how to get started. Today it's a lot more, uh, what I would say for in, uh, uh, active credit union lenders or SBA credit union lenders with, with, with a commercial practice who have some experience under their belt but also might be training new staff or want things, uh, key things to remember going forward. And so uh, that's the purpose of today's training. And the big goal with the today's training is things to keep in mind about the guarantee. Because obviously the real benefit of SBA lending and using SBA guaranteed loans is that that guarantee helps lower the risk profile when you're making lending to small businesses. And that is the benefit, that's the design of the program, 
And so everything we're going to talk about today is within, the, it was, is within that goal of trying to preserve the guarantee through the origination, servicing, and liquidation cycles. I'm joined today by uh, two of my colleagues. First, I'm going to introduce Rosemary Drake, who I'm very excited uh, to, to welcome to this training and webinar. Um, and I want you guys out there to actually certainly know who Rosemary Drake is. She is our new uh, chief of our 7A loan program, and uh, she has an extensive resume and background and is the perfect person for her position. She has over two decades of private lending experience, as well as she has worked at SBA as both a lender relations specialist and then moved to management as a deputy district director in the Atlanta office. She then went to Bank of America, and then just a few months ago, she decided to come back and serve the country, and now she's our 7A loan program chief. She's supremely qualified. We are really excited to have her today. And what she's going to do is give you a preview of our SOP, our standard operating procedure for our loan programs. She's going to talk about what's new or what's coming up and what to keep in mind, because an SBA lender, you have to uh, use our SOPs or kind of our, our, our way of doing business as an SBA lender. And the one that Rosemary is, is going to talk about is the, or the one that's coming up, is the one that most SBA lenders are very familiar with, which is basically our eligibility and origination uh, focused on our loan programs. Um, so, Rosemary, take it away. Thank you, Bill. I am going to try to navigate this. While we talk through it, the thing I like to talk about most is takeaways. So today, there are three takeaways I would like for everyone to walk away with. So if you don't have your pencils right there in front of you, this presentation will be sent out to you uh, like they were talked about earlier today. So first thing you want to ask yourself is, do you have a 750 agreement? If you don't have a 750 agreement, that is required for the SBA uh, 7A program. It is not required for the 504 loan program, and we're going to talk about that in a second. So the 7A loan program, you require a 750 agreement. If you do not know if you have a 750 agreement, talk to your local district office. They will tell you if you have a 750 agreement on hand. If you currently have a 750 agreement, know that there was a notice that came out in September, um, 5019016. I believe it was, uh, that combines all of our 750 agreements uh, with the exception of the uh, Community Advantage 750. The other ones will be combined into this one. If you currently have a 750 on file, there's nothing for you to do. If you do not, you will have one 750 agreement if you qualify. Making sure that you qualify is really critical. And also one of the questions may come up is, can I use a QSO to submit my application for a 750? The answer to that is no. You must be able to have an authorized person at your credit union that can sign on behalf of your credit union to submit the application and certify that you qualify using our standard operating procedures. And currently we're in SOP 5010-5K. The next SOP, once it gets through clearance, will be 5010-5-6, excuse me, 5010-6. Next, do you need systems in place? No new systems do you need to acquire to deploy the SBA loan program. SBA 1 is your kind of one-stop application for origination servicing and closing and liquidating SBA loan. And we have some snapshots there um, in this presentation that will walk you through how to originate a 7A loan using our 1919 and 1920 forms. Also, our new navigation, navigation tool that's embedded in our new SOP once it's released, and we can have separate trainings on that as well. So there's a few key things that I would like you to take away from this. Um, again, just an overview, the 504 loan program. We didn't talk about that a second ago. Why? Because you, that is a conventional loan for the bank. The certified development company partners with you, and that is the party that will go directly to the SBA to populate that portion of the loan. Again, it's a 50-40-10 split where the applicant will bring in at least 10%, the CDC for 40% or 35%. And then also the conventional lender, yourself being the credit union, would actually do a conventional loan. There is an interim loan that you would cover until the debenture is funded. And definitely reach out to your local CDC. And how do you contact your local CDC? You can also go through your local district office. We're not going to really talk about microloan programs and CA and international trade loan programs on this uh, conference today. But we will explore more of those at another time. 504 loan program. Again, it's a conventional loan. Just want to give you a highlight of that. Now let's get into how you deploy the SBA 7A loan program. The 1919 is the borrower's application. 
the 1920 is the lender's application. This is also embedded in SBA 1. SBA 1, again, is one of our takeaways. It is what you use to deploy the program. It will help populate all these forms for you. The 1919 is to be completed by every applicant business and every principal of that business. All principals must be documented on the form 1919. The 1919 form also will be used if you have a real estate holding company, which we call an eligible passive company. The real estate holding company is a separate entity that would be your applicant borrower. And then also the operating company will have a separate 1919. The 1920 will be completed for each application for the lender at one specific time. Again, this is all going to be populated in SBA 1 for use for you to use so that you don't have to worry about having a lot of paperwork. So you have the 1919, you've completed the application. One thing to remember in the 1919 and 1920, in the 1919, it's going to capture a lot of eligibility. Is a client eligible? So one way to do that also is to go directly to our SOP. In our SOP, uh, the new SOP is set up as a navigation. Many of the lenders have been asking for the SOP to be revamped, standard operating procedures. This is set up in the core areas of the SOP. You're going to have core requirements, and you're going to have specific requirements for each of the programs. So it'll be easier to navigate so that as you are a new lender or an experienced lender, you will be able to use this navigation tool to look specific information up about each program, but there are core requirements that you will need to have for each SBA loan. That's critical. We're going to talk about a few of those right now. So credit elsewhere. Credit elsewhere. You must certify that the applicant does not have the ability to obtain a loan from other sources. This should be done for each applicant. It cannot be a blanket statement. You want to make sure that you use, if it's for credit with regard to collateral, if it's regard to the loan terms, or the client does not have sufficient capital to put down for a conventional loan. That would be some reasons for credit elsewhere, but this cannot be a blanket statement. That's very critical, and it will also be embedded in SBA 1. Personal guarantees. SBA loans are full recourse loans. Remember that all SBA loans require each 20% or more owner guarantee the note. Also, if a spouse is a non-owner and they're pledging collateral or they have less than 20% because they do benefit from the loan proceeds. Corporate entities with 20% or more must also guarantee an SBA loan with the exception of an ESOP. Want to make sure that there's full disclosure again on the 1919 that you have all that information populated into the eligibility with regard to personal guarantees. Then we move on to underwriting. Again, from an underwriting standpoint, you're going to do everything you would on a conventional loan. You're going to use prudent lending practices. You're going to make sure from an SBA standpoint that there's equity re injection requirements. Equity injection requirements is 10% for a startup business. That's the minimum requirement for SBA. And then also for partner buyout or for real estate transactions. You want to make sure that you can Document equity injection and make sure that if it is borrowed, you follow the standards of the SOP with regard to borrowed equity and making sure that you have sources to repay the borrowed equity outside of the business. And that's very critical, and that is one of the things that when you go to the purchase center that many of the lenders do not adequately document equity injection where it came from, and you must make sure that it's seasoned. If it is borrowed again, you must make sure there's outside income to support that outside of the business, and you must document that. From a collateral standpoint, when you're underwriting, SBA's guidelines are very specific in the SOP, and we're going to populate this information for you. Again, SBA's guidelines are basically the minimum guidelines, so you can have additional guidelines as well, but ours is the minimum guideline. Loans 25000 and below do not require any collateral. However, when you get between 25000 and 350, there are some minimum requirements for collateral. And SBA loans from a standpoint of 350 and above up to the maximum of $5 million, it does require full collateral coverage, making sure that you take all available assets, both business and personal. And there is a chart in our SOP that can guide you on what SBA's requirements are from a collateral standpoint. Making sure that you look at financial projections and validate those financial projections. Or SBA also requires three years of historical tax returns for existing businesses 
And you must analyze those tax returns. You must analyze the financial projections as well. You want to make sure that when you look at the financial assumptions, they make sense, and you're using your prudent lending practices, and you want to make sure they're fully documented. You must also get the IRS transcript, and we're going to talk about the IRS transcript in a second. From an underwriting standpoint, you're going to still create your credit memo. Your credit memo really is making sure you as the lender has done everything you need to do to understand if that client has the ability and the willingness to repay the loan based on the guidelines set forth in the SOP, but also in your credit policy. And you should have credit policy set forth so that you know the guidelines in which you're looking to lend money. The SBA authorization is actually the agreement between the SBA and the lender for the terms bonding the conditions of that loan. So make sure that in your credit memo, you're referencing things that's going to be in your loan authorization. It is important that your loan authorization is fully developed so that you can actually close and service the loan properly to protect your SBA guarantee. We're almost finished here. IRS transcripts. Again, IRS transcripts are what you need to, make, to obtain to verify that the tax returns that you receive from your applicant business also matches what they submitted to the IRS. That is very critical. And you want to make sure that they match. If they do not match, please go to the SOP. There are certain requirements that you need to follow if they do not match. So we talked a little bit about underwriting. We talked a little bit about capturing all of the information on eligibility standpoint. The portal in which you use is the SBA1 platform. How do you access that? You access that through our capital financial system, and you're going to do a user ID and password. The great thing about our login system, capital access login system, is that each person in your financial institution will have their own unique ID so that you can populate the information for that particular user of the system. It helps you to create an experience that you're training your staff, you're having a secure online application, but also Again, the SOP is embedded in SBA 1, so it's going to help you with eligibility determination. It's going to help you with structure. It's going to help you with documentation because you're going to upload the documentation. And even more so, when there's errors, it's going to tell you it's an error so that you do not have to move forward. You're going to get that information. It's going to save your data, and you're going to be able to go back into that application and submit it directly online. And there is no cost to you for this. So there are many benefits of having this SBA1 platform because it also accepts electronic signature and we talked about some of the other things before but it's going to help you through the entire process of the loan for SBA from origination to liquidation if liquidation is something that you have to do and hopefully you're doing prudent lending and you won't need to use our liquidation centers however if you're using the SBA loan product we do understand there are going to be some losses so you want to make sure that you actually originate close and service the loan property so you can protect your guarantee on the back end. So here are a few options and before we wrap it up here about what the options menu look like on the SBA1 platform. You have the home page. It's going to lay it all out for you. It's going to show you where you're going to go. It's going to give you a pipeline. Then it's going to allow you to create an application and there is an expert version that's used for our delegated lender and then there's a step-by-step -step process used for our non-delegated lender. Our delegated lender is the one that has the unilateral authority to approve an SBA loan without the, sending it directly to the SBA with the exception of getting an SBA loan number, saying that they've met all their minimum requirements from an eligibility standpoint. It's also going to let you upload all of your documentation into our system, which is submitted directly to eTran, which is the electronic transmission system behind SBA 1, and most of our seasoned lenders know about eTran. So, to wrap this all up, and we have a few minutes for questions as we move on to our next speaker, Susan, is if you need additional information, you definitely want to reach out to your local district office, one, to see if you have a 750 agreement on file, two, how do you log into the capital access login system to get SBA 1, third, you want to make sure that you're doing all of the necessary things to get an application, and if you're not already approved to be an SBA lender. We'll work with you through the process. We have our other recess port partners as well, the Small Business Development Centers, the Women's Business Centers, SCORE, and our Veterans Opportunity Business Centers. So you have a number of resources to help you with your clients, to help you with the SBA process, and we're looking forward to working with you. And I'm going to toss it back to Bill. Great. <laughs> Thanks, Rosemary. And uh, 
as you can see, that's those are some of the big things to keep in mind and how to go about getting started in the origination cycle, original origination part of the cycle, a loan cycle with SBA loans and things to really keep in mind and things that we keep uh, looking for. Uh, joining me to my left is Susan Suckfeld. Susan Suckfeld is the Superv supervisory loan analyst in our uh, Office of Financial Program and Operations. And what uh, Susan does is, is, is basically oversee um, a lot of the, uh, uh, sorry, I'm just getting my slides here right now. And uh, she oversees a lot of our loan centers where the loan centers are serviced and also then ultimately liquidated. She has over 14 years of experience at SBA, including eight years at our National Guarantee Purchase Center. And that's where we actually, loans that have uh, defaulted are, are, are basically uh, purchased by the government for guarantee. And what Susan's going to provide to you today is an update on the uh, SOP governing servicing and liquidation, as well as uh, just as, as, as uh, Rosemary did earlier on the loan uh, program L uh, SOP. She's also going to give you some things to keep in mind throughout the servicing and liquidation cycle so that you can preserve the guarantee and then actually how to secure the guarantee as well as your responsibilities uh, when you submit for a purchase uh, for the guarantee. So, Susan, take it away. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Go ahead. Get up. Oh. They're in the wrong order. Um, so, as Bill mentioned earlier, I'm um, now in the Office of Financial Program Operations. The Office of Financial Program Operations has nine different centers across the country. Um, our centers include everything from origination on loans that are not done delegated, as Rosemary was talking about earlier, um, from servicing all the way through liquidation. And we also have three disaster home loan servicing centers um, in California and in Texas. So there's a nice little picture that you can save. All right, so the first thing I want to talk about are some of the screen out issues that we see in our loan guarantee processing center in Citrus Heights, California. Um, I asked them to give me their top list of what's happening right now. The first one is financial statements and projections are incomplete. So as you're sending loan packages to be approved um, and to get that SBA loan number and get the money out the door, make sure that you are sending complete financial analysis. Um, make sure that all of your projections are complete and supportable. Um, the second issue that they've been finding is the credit memo is incomplete. Um, when we're talking about a credit memo, as Rosemary was talking about earlier, we want to make sure that the credit memo includes a complete capture of exactly how the loan is going to work, um, and we're going to need to be able to see what the um, uses of proceeds are, um, all the collateral, all the equity injection. It should be a complete summary of the loan, and we are seeing packages that are coming to SBA for approval that are not complete. Um, the last biggest issue that we're seeing are 1919 and 1920 forms that are missing. Um, for example, if they're not, if you don't have a 1919 for every borrower um, that's part of the loan, if those are missing, that will be screened out and will be sent back to you to complete. Um, and if there are spots that are missing on the 1920, we need to have those completed as well. All right, so now into servicing and liquidation with our other centers. We are working right now on a new SOP. It will be 50573. Um, this SOP, what we're doing is trying to clean it up and get it more up to date. Our last one was issued a couple of years ago, and so we want to make sure that we're keeping in line with um, the changes that are coming with the industry. The first big change that you will see on 5057 is that we are um, – changing up the definition on prudent liquidation. Now the definition, the heart of it is remaining the same. What we are doing is updating it so that it is now current with um, the loans that were rolled in from the last SOP on prudent liquidation. That definition, just in case you're not aware, basically says that after a guarantee is purchased that a prudent liquidation should only take 24 months to complete unless SBA um, provides for an exception on that case. The second big update that we are doing is an update to the litigation plan chapter. Um, so as you're liquidating loans, um, we are updating how you submit over a litigation plan to SBA and some of the requirements that are in there. 
the biggest impact that lenders will see with this change is that we are now going to be asking for a status report every six months on the litigation plans and what's happening with each specific case. Um, the next thing that you'll see in our new SOP is a chapter on special program loans. So as you're going through servicing and liquidating some of our 7A loans that are in the special program, for example, international trade, export working capital loans, and cap line loans, um, you'll have a special chapter that will dedicate just to those. The other biggest impact um, that lenders will see in our new SOP is that we are going to require all guarantee purchase packages to be submitted electronically to us. Um, this SOP, we are expecting to have it released in the next few months and have it effective in early 2020. So along with our SOP, some of you might be aware that SBA issues what we call a unilateral action matrix. This is a tool that SBA creates that we want just as a a tool for you to understand what actions you need to come to SBA for and what actions you can approve delegated. Um, this does not replace the SOP. It's just supposed to be a nice little handy cheat sheet, if you will. This version 15 is the one that's in place now. You can find this um, on SBA's website. It also is in, um, with every district office has a copy of it, and you can find it floating around all kinds of places. Um, now, this, S, this matrix is the last one that's going to correspond to SOP 5057-2. The next version um, will go for our new SOP and will be released in the spring, and it might look a little different than the one that it, the way it looks now. The other thing that we are working on is we have updated our purchase demand package um, sometimes these are called tabs, sometimes you can hear them referred to as a PDK or a Purchase Demand Kit. Um, we have these available on our website now. You can go um, onto the center's websites to be able to see them. And we are working on an information notice that will be released. At this point in time, um, if you do have a loan that needs to be guaranteed purchased, you can use either the old version of the tabs or the new version of the tabs. Either one will be fine. All right, so when you have a loan that goes to SBA for a guarantee purchase, there's um, different outcomes that you can have. And what I kind of wanted to do is just explain what the terminology is for the possible outcomes of a purchase review so that everybody's on the same page. So the first one is what everyone hopes for and that SBA strives to do, and that is a purchase in full. Um, if this is the case, then we will either pay um, the credit union back um, for SBA's share of the guarantee, or we will pay it off of the secondary market and there will be no more um, recovery from the credit union. The second um, thing that could happen is called a repair. A repair happens when um, the lender and SBA agrees that there was some sort of harm through the origination, servicing, and liquidation of the loan and that harm can be valued at a specific amount and it does not exceed the outstanding balance of the loan. So for example, if you have a million dollar loan that you're having guarantee purchased and something happens during the life of the loan and causes harm to the agency in the amount of $100,000, SBA is not going to say that you have no guarantee. We are simply going to say, let's repair it for 100,000 and be able to still pay you $900,000. So that's what a repair is. Um, a denial is a decision that the guarantee is no longer in effect. I will tell you that when a denial happens, um, it is reviewed not only by the center, but then it also, the authority to formally deny a loan lies in headquarters. So that will be elevated to the headquarters level before a decision to deny a loan can be reached. Um, the fourth option is a cancellation or a termination of the guarantee. This is something that the lender is in agreement with. So for example, if you have a loan that's at the purchase center and you know that there is an eligibility issue and the center identifies it and you agree that there is no guarantee, then we will be able to cancel the guarantee and move forward. The last one, the withdrawal, is more like a pause button. 
So, for example, if you have a loan and you are missing some sourcing for your equity injection, um, and you know you have it, but it's maybe in a file that's in archives or it's not um, readily accessible, you can withdraw the guarantee review. We can push pause, and then in a couple of months or whenever you find the documentation and you want to send it back to SBA, you can send it back and the review will pick up right where it left off. So when we are looking through a purchase review, we look through um, origination, closing, servicing, and liquidation. The easiest way to think of it, whenever SBA is reviewing a loan, we're going to look at all actions that happened from the very beginning of the loan all the way up and through the day that we are doing the review. So our guarantee purchase flow, I have a nice little chart coming up on the next slide. Um, but Basically, any time, no matter which center you're dealing with, if you have a guarantee purchase um, that's being reviewed, there is always what we call the rule of two. So you're going to have a loan officer and an approver review each and every loan and all of the documentation. The other um, piece of that is we also have an attorney that reviews every purchase review to make sure that um, the decision that we are making is sound. Um, so for every single review, that you can be assured that a minimum of three people will be looking at that review, um, and in some cases there are more, so you'll be able to see. So on this slide you can see when a guarantee purchase comes into SBA, the first thing that we do is we bring it in and into our system, um, take it in, that's called our intake process, and then we go through a screening process, which is basically we are ensuring that the package is complete. We are not going through and looking at every little document at that time. We are just making sure that, um, that if you are required to do one of the tabs, that it is complete and sent to us. The next step is a legal one review. This is where an attorney will review the loan for loan eligibility. Um, for example, was it an eligible business to begin with? Um, and then the next step is financial review, where a loan officer will go through and look at all the actions that were taken. Sometimes there's a legal two, a step five review. Um, that review happens if the loan is ready for charge off and all action is complete at the time or if there's any repair or denial. And then the last step is an approver will take a look at that review. At any one of those stages, if we find that there's missing information, we don't just stop the process. What we do is we send it over to our customer service team who will reach out to you and try and get the missing information or the additional documentation that can help move it to the next phase. So um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was our top reasons for repair and denial. I always think that it's really good to learn from others' mistakes so that you don't make them again. Um, so here's our current list of what we're seeing in the center. The first big issue is lien and collateral issues that result in missed recoveries. Um, so in these types of cases, the, the biggest example that I can give you is say you have a loan and you are supposed to be in first position on business assets. By the time you actually close and you're able to file your lien, there, something happened, there was a delay, and you file it, and then lo and behold, somebody got in in front of you. And so you're in second instead of in first position as re was required by the loan authorization. When we get down to liquidation, you obviously can't get the full recovery amount from that first position because it's not yours. Um, so then SVA will take the amount of the first lien and assess that as a repair. So your guarantee would still be good minus the amount of harm that was caused by the action. Um, the second big issue is unauthorized use of proceeds. So think of this just as a very straightforward, your loan authorization sets out exactly how the loan proceeds are supposed to be used. If there are um, variances from that that caused harm to the agency or to the business, then that would be a repair. Generally, we do not deny loans in full based on um, unauthorized use of proceeds. That would be a repair for just the amount of the harm. All right, the next thing is liquidation deficiencies. These are almost always repairs, um, and this is usually something happened at the time of liquidation um, that resulted in SBA not being able to fully 
um, get the recoveries that we were entitled to. So the biggest one here, think about if you have a loan that is going bad, you're supposed to do the site visit within 60 days um, of payment default, and for whatever reason, you weren't able to get out to the business until 90 days. And at 90 days past default, you find that everything's gone. Then we would figure out what the value was for everything that was missing, and that would be a repair. Um, undocumented servicing actions are almost always a repair. Um, these are things, for example, um, if you have hazard insurance on property and you get notice that the hazard insurance was not paid for by the borrower and you had a decision either to force place or to allow it to lapse and um, if you didn't do anything to follow up with that, then SBA would be looking at that as a repair. All right, um, the, next, um, the next couple of reasons on this slide are a little um, more serious. So the first one is early defaults. For an early default, when SBA looks at that, it's very black and white. If the early default issues cause the failure of the business, then that will be a full denial. For example, if you're not able to verify the equity injection, as Rosemary talked about earlier, and the money was not seasoned in the borrower's bank account or the sourcing wasn't available, and we can directly tie that to the failure of the business, then that is going to be a full denial of liability. Um, other early default issues that we've seen recently are missing tax transcripts um, and unsupported um, cash flow on the credit memo. The next big issue is loan eligibility. This is very severe. Again, for loan eligibility, there are no repairs. Either it's a full purchase or a full denial. Um, these are for businesses that are ineligible to receive SBA financing um, or if you have a borrower or um, a guarantor that is unable to receive financing and you give them financing anyhow, then that would be a full denial. Um, the, la or the second to last one here is the release of guarantors without SBA's prior written approval, and that would also be a denial. Um, that is something that SBA has held very tight to and that we need to make sure that we are approving the release of all guarantors. Um, and then the last one that we've seen, which would be more of a repair, is the failure to file a proof of claim during a bankruptcy. So this sheet um, I like to include in the handouts just because it's a great another cheat sheet that we put together to figure out um, which center you would go to for your specific loan. Um, so you can see whether or not you would go to the um, National Guarantee Purchase Center in Herndon, Virginia, or one of the commercial loan servicing centers in Fresno or Little Rock based on which type of loan you have and um, the value of that loan. So after the loan is purchased, um, everything isn't all the way done. We still have to be able to follow up. The way that SBA follows up with you is through a semi-annual status report. So what we do is every six months in March and October, we send you a spreadsheet that looks like this, and it is pre-populated with all of your bank's loan information. So anything that's tied to your lender ID number is going to be appearing on this chart that'll be emailed. Um, what we ask is that you send us back a code, and we'll give you a code cheat, um, sheet that goes with this. I believe there's seven different loan status codes to be able to tell us exactly what's happening with, the, with each of the loans. And you can make comments on where we are on every loan all the way through um, completion of the liquidation activities and charge off. This is a really great way for SBA to keep a handle on our portfolio and to know um, at a minimum every six months exactly what's happening with each and every loan. The last slide that I wanted to give out um, was a contact list. So on the top left, you have our loan guarantee purchasing or loan guarantee processing center in Citrus Heights, California. Um, on the top right, you have our guarantee purchase center in Herndon, Virginia. And then on the bottom, you have our two commercial loan servicing centers, um, both in Little Rock, Arkansas, and in Fresno, California. 
Um, these are primarily the centers that you're going to be dealing with, and it's just a nice sheet for you to have to be able to print out and stick up somewhere so that you can have all the contact information. And with that, I am going to turn it back over to Bill. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Susan. And I, I think the one thing we want to stress, particularly to our credit union lenders who might not have uh, as much familiarity with SBA lending or you might, uh, you know, uh, be a new member on your lending team or what have you, is SBA 1 helps you through a lot of these challenges and make sure that you're doing everything you can to preserve the guarantee. But also, too, if you go back to, if we uh, just jump back to that slide real quick, there, all these emails and, and points of contact are meant to help you and throughout the process so that you are not alone. And we encourage lenders who are stuck to reach out to folks and uh, at where they are in their cycle and see what they can do to make sure that they're preserving the guarantee because we want to do all that we can to uh, make sure that you get the guarantee uh, where, where appropriate. Real briefly, also, I'm just going to touch on something. As an SBA lender, uh, part of what our responsibility at the Office of Capital Access to do is to make sure that we are providing some oversight of lenders through our Office of Credit Risk Management. And they do a series of reviews uh, f as part of their process. And briefly, um, as you can see, they do a, 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 a variety of reviews. But basically, a desktop review is for generally for lenders who are doing less than $10 million a loan a year, all the way up to a full review, which could be a, a lender doing hundreds of millions of dollars SB loans a year. And it's just part of the process, but this is some of the, uh, when they're talking about reviews, as you can see, it goes from desktop, which is relatively straightforward, to a full review, which is a little bit more intensive. And all of it, of course, is centered on helping avoid ta taxpayer risk. As a federally uh, funded pro uh, government guarantee program, we want to ensure that we are being prudent in how we use the taxpayer dollar um, when guarantees are purchased and making sure that uh, we are doing that. And, and a lot of people play a lot, or, or there are many aspects of how we engage in that risk management. Um, one, we use technology. Uh, we use, uh, you know, an data analytics to see and track our loans from a portfolio perspective, just as you would. We also have loan program requirements where we talk with our policy staff like Rosemary constantly. Um, we also have, uh, you know, credit risk managers uh, who are part of their job is to do lender reviews. And then again, we have our protocols as well in lender reviews that I just talked about. And from our credit risk management team, they kind of relay to me that, again, some of the deficiency drivers when they do a review or things that they see are, you know, concerns about Code of Federal Regulations. Obviously, uh, we want to make sure that folks are paying attention to the uh, Code of Federal Regulations and the SOPs. The SOPs are really your friends. We are, we are trying to make them simpler and easier to understand and easier to follow and that they make more sense. Also, forms, as both uh, Rosemary and Susan said, Form 1919 or 1920, crucial part, and that's when you're starting out at the origination. And then also, as we update our policy and information notices, those are things that our credit risk management team look at as well. So that concludes our presentation right now. We're going to take some questions uh, going forward. And um, I think one of the first questions, uh, Lou, was we wanted to, was uh, about QSOs or? Yeah, I think that there was a discussion about how to uh, best engage with SBA if you are a new a credit union that wants to be involved with SBA lending. So uh, one good way to do that is to hire the services of a QSO, a reputable, reputable QSO, that understands SBA lending, that knows all the ins and outs of SBA lending, and work with them to gain the knowledge uh, so that you can, you know, be active with SBA lending. The only caveat with that is when you use a QSO, just make sure that you are not totally relying on them. You, ha you yourself have to be in, in control of that relationship. You have to do your due diligence of that QSO, and just make sure that you are handling all aspects of the SBA loan program and not totally outsourcing it to the QSO. They can be a partner in it, but you are in control of it as a credit union. Rosemary, I'll be in. Lou, it is important for the, the, the lender to understand that if you do use a, a QSO, you want to make sure that, one, you can't submit the application to become a lender through the QSO. And if you do use the, the QSO after you become an SBA lender, you want to make sure that you're filling out the Form 159 for compensation agreements. You want to make sure that anyone is getting paid as a part of the loan, uh, they're do fully documented, and what the fees are associated with. The SBA has maximums in which you are allowed to charge the applicant, and you want to make sure that that is fully disclosed 
but also make sure that you reach out to your other credit unions to see if they're using um, someone and to make sure that you're using a credible, because credible QSO, the lender service provider, what we call them also, um, is, is not charged with making sure you originate, service, and close your loan or liquidate your loan. It is the lender's ultimate responsibility to make sure that they're um, doing um, prudent lending practices. So if you're currently not lending in the commercial platform, you want to make sure that you understand the commercial lending platform first before you delve into doing an SBA loan because it is specialized and you should already have something in your portfolio whether you purchase other commercial loans and you're servicing them that you do understand commercial lending because it is a specialized lending platform and we want to make sure that uh, each of the credit unions are successful in the loan program. Great and just as a reminder if you have questions for anyone uh, you can submit them in via the chat box um, in your on your screen uh, it should be down there's a there's a, a, a menu on the left side, on the left side. Yes. and also Bill we'd like to um, remind our audience that we have a survey it's in, I believe it's a magenta colored. It's called survey. It's called survey. Yeah, so there's a survey it. <laughs> widget. Please uh, take the survey. It's a very short survey that we'd like you to do. And um, we're going to go right into the, the Q&A. And George Kudwa is going to manage the Q&A. So I think you have a couple of questions for yeah, our speakers. I okay. Uh, Susan, I think this question goes to you. Um, we have someone here who wants to find out if a guaranteed purchase is the same as obtaining an approval from the SBA. Um, a guarantee purchase yeah. happens when a loan has defaulted, and um, so it's the back end. That is how you get the guarantee paid back to the credit union. An approval would be how you get the actual loan number and you're able to start. Rosemary, I don't know. Did I just muddy it more? No, you okay. didn't. No, you did. So, um, so, so the, yeah, the, the the purchase process is is when there has been a default, and and it would go to Susan's team. They from an origination standpoint, is when you get the the loan number. So you're making sure from an eligibility standpoint, if it's eligible from our basic standards, and then also from a credit standard, is when you would get the loan approved. The purchase is the approval of the. SBA's purchase back from the lender when the loan has defaulted. Right. Okay. okay. Yep. So there's a question for Rosemary. Rosemary, um, we have a question. Uh, the person wants to find out if uh, the IRS still takes 4506Ts by fax? Yes. So there's been a, a recent um, challenge with the IRS transcripts. There is a, it is done by fax, and then you would have to have a fax cover. There is a new version of the 4506T that came out in March. However, there's been some challenges that we've heard from a lot of our lenders. You have to use the older version of the 4506 with the current fax form. Um, and if you uh, would reach out to us, we can give you that current information on how to get the, the current forms, and then also the, the fax number that you need for the area to fax it in because the fax cover is required with the 4506T if you're using it directly through IRS. If you're using a vendor, the vendor does something a little bit different. Okay, good. So there's another question I believe is for you, Rosemary. So um, I believe when you were speaking earlier, um, the credit union wanted to know if you could go back over when a spouse is required to guarantee. Did you mention that? Sure, I okay, did. Thank you. So there are multiple times when a spouse is required to guarantee. So the spouse can have less than 20% ownership. Typically, the spouse is going to guarantee the note if they have any type of ownership in the company. Or if the spouse has no ownership in the company, but it's pledging collateral, then it's particularly going to be a limited guarantee. There are also some instances where the spouse may be required to guarantee if they have benefit from the loan. For example, the spouse is an officer in the company but has no ownership. The spouse then would be required to guarantee the note. Okay, fantastic. Um, audience, you can still submit questions. And while you're thinking about your questions, you may also download the presentation using the widget. Resources, yes. The resources widget that's on your console um, if you want to download it. 
we have about eight minutes left, but we don't have any more questions right now. Um, but I'll ask the panel a question. Is there any particular information or you identified early on the presentation that there are some areas where people, where credit unions may run into problems, but have you identified some maybe key areas that credit unions can work on when they are submitting their information um, to SBA that maybe would help them to get their, their loans approved? Sure. I'll speak to it, and then Susan, you see it on the back end, so it would be um, a good idea for you to speak fluidly to everything that you're seeing on the back end. Uh, most often it's... Um, the application process, understanding eligibility and understanding what's eligible and what's not eligible, and then also completing the application. Most often applications, the 1919 and the 1920, come in incomplete, and so we don't have all the information necessary to make a decision, so there's multiple screen outs, and then when you have screen outs, it, it leads for a long lag time, and then information is not disclosed. So those are the most critical areas in making sure you document Documentation is critical, not in SBA lending, but in all sorts of lending. Absolutely. You want to make sure you adequately document your files for even your regulators. So you want to make sure in an SBA loan that you document your files for future use, as if the person that's processing the loan is not going to be there. You want to make sure someone can come in that did not process the loan that can follow the flow of the application from the time that it's originated, service closed, and, of course, if the process for liquidation. Excellent Susan. point. Yeah, for, from the guarantee purchase standpoint, um, the biggest thing is to remember that when you send a, a loan in for purchase, the people that are reviewing it have never seen that loan before. So like Rosemary was saying, we need a complete story. We need to know exactly what happened, who the players were, um, try and tell it to us like we've never seen it because we haven't, um, and use all that documentation to give us a clear picture. The other thing um, that I would say is if you're going through a servicing request and you're not sure, ask questions. Um, our center has email boxes dedicated to just questions that we can just answer. And there's, those are manned um, by very skilled loan officers that have been there and have the knowledge to be able to help you through your specific um, cases. And then the last thing is when you are submitting a guarantee purchase request to the center, um, if you're not sure about something or if you have um, a spot that is not applicable to your loan, feel free to write notes um, on the tabs so that your loan officer, when they get it, it can be quickly um, gone through with just an email or a phone call to you rather than having to go through a formal screen out and send it to customer service. It'll make it flow a little faster. So feel free as you're doing your guarantee purchase packages to send notes um, to the loan officer that's going to be reviewing it. So those would be my big hints for you. Yeah. And guess what? We got some more questions. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Go ahead, George. We have a credit union that wants to find out how to become a preferred lender. And this goes to the panel. It wasn't directed to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. You, you would definitely need to go to our SOP. There are requirements for if you currently have a 750 agreement, um, how many loans you've done, and I want to say it's five loans within the last 24 months um, that you've actually been able to get through the entire process. You're going to submit it um, through your district office because they're going to do the initial review to make sure you meet all the minimum qualifications before they submit it up to um, the Office of Capital Access to review it full to make sure that, that you can have the authority. So the key thing in submitting for delegated authority is to make sure that without a lender service provider that you can originate, close, service, and liquidate the loan, and you're going to submit a package. There is full details in the SOP. The current SOP, 5010-5K, has that in there, as well as the upcoming SOP. That's something that's standard in the SOP. Awesome. Well, I would also add that you also have to be in good standing with your financial regulator uh -huh. and yes. with SBA. Thank you, Lou, <laughs> for that information. Um, we had a question, and, and George was getting ready to, to answer it, but I want to give this question to the panel. Um, so we have a, a credit union that enjoyed this part of the webinar. They missed the first part, um, but they'd like to be able to reach out to your offices, I believe, for further information. Um, is there, is this particular... I think I just popped it up there, Franz, so that the audience can see. You, you guys had a link there. 
um, that we used last at our last webinar, uh, Bill. Do you, is that the, the link that they need to go to? Yeah, so a, a few things. One, um, this I, my understanding is this actual webinar will be online in a few weeks with the transcript. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, the second thing, too, is, is that we would encourage you to reach out to your local district office, sba.gov slash local dash assistance is how you find the closest SBA district office to you and ask for the lender relations specialist. That person can do a few things. Obviously, that can be your internal point of contact as you become more proficient in SBA lending and also can update you. And as somebody nearby who can kind of keep you up to date on, on the latest ins and outs on SBA lending. The second thing, too, is, is that we have quarterly connect calls for our 7A loan program. And that's an opportunity where our headquarters policy office of our loan programs engages the lenders, updates them on what's going on, and all of that. That is free of charge. That's available to every SBA lender. Um, your, your, your local district office lender relations specialist can sign you up for that or make sure that you get on the list so that you can participate in those webinars as well as part of your ongoing training. But also, too, we'd like to hear back from you. Um, what you think is helpful about these past two webinars and what you would like to hear about uh, more from us coming in the future. And then we can take that information, put it in our quarterly connect calls, or maybe do additional webinars in the coming years. Awesome. Okay. Our last question for the day. Um, for the owner's spouse pledging collateral, would they sign a security agreement or a deed of trust and a limited guarantee? They're going to require everything that you would normally require to secure the collateral. So um, more than likely, if they own the collateral, there's already a deed of trust with their name on it. There is a security agreement that they will file, and it will be a limited guarantee. However, in some cases, it may be a full guarantee if the spouse has ownership, even if it's um, a nominal ownership in the business that spouse may need to have a full guarantee even though they're just pledging collateral. Awesome. Thank you, Rosemary. Well, it looks like we are fresh out of questions. And since we have a minute left, we're just going to go to our final slide so that we can show the uh, audience the contact information for NCUA, um, the Office of Credit Union Resources and Expansion, our Contact information is there. And as we mentioned earlier, you may be able to download this SBA presentation um, to review it a different at another time. Both part one and part two will be available on NCUA.gov and on our LMS, the Cure LMS, in approximately two to three weeks. We'd like to thank our SBA partners, Bill, Rosemary, Susan. We'd like to thank Lou who is part of the NCOA. We also would love to thank Franz, who is our behind the scenes guy that takes care of us. Thank you, George. And thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate your questions and your interest. Please have a wonderful afternoon and a great week.